Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Happy New Year and welcome to the first 2017 edition of Apex Express, a show that brings you the voices and perspectives of Asians and Asian Americans. I am your host and producer, Preeti Mangla Shekhar. As we brace ourselves for a grim and difficult political climate that begins with the presidential inauguration on January 20th, we will bring you the voices and analysis of activists and organizers resisting the global shift to the right, including here in the U.S. On tonight's show, we go international and begin by learning about women's movements in India through a particularly popular phenomenon called self-help groups, or SAGs. Later in the show, we spotlight human rights violations in China through the lens of a new Oscar shortlisted documentary. Stay tuned. Women's movements in India have a long and rich history of resisting and mobilizing against various issues, from fighting domestic violence and rape and sexual harassment to fighting for property ownership rights and challenging regressive laws. One particular phenomenon that is unique to South and Southeast Asia is that of self-help groups. Women's self-help groups usually consist of a village-based intermediary committee of self-organized women of about 10 to 20 in number. In our first segment, we learn about how the neoliberal Indian state, under the guise of fighting poverty and promoting women's rights, manipulatively promotes microcredit or microfinance among rural and poor women through women's self-help groups and how the actual reality on the ground is much more complex and complicated. I filed a story from India where I got to discuss with noted feminist author and academic Kalpana Karunakaran about her research from her book, Women, Microfinance and the State in Neoliberal India. A little bit about Kalpana before you hear my discussion with her. Kalpana Karunakaran is Assistant Professor at the Humanities and Social Sciences Department at IIT Madras. She has written extensively on gender, poverty, women's labor, and microcredit. She has been an activist with popular people's science movements and has organized women's microcredit or self-help group federations and right-to-health campaigns that included public audits of rural primary health centers and women's health status. She is currently an executive committee member of the Indian Association of Women's Studies. She participates actively in Tamil feminist theatre as well as in workshops and campaigns for gender equality organised by women's rights movements and non-profit organisations. So thank you, Kalpana, for making time for our show. Thank you, Preeti. It's my privilege to be here. Great. So let's get started. Um, Your book is a veritable tome on women and microfinance. But before we get dive into the book, let's kind of uh, break down some of the concepts uh, that, uh, you know, frames your research. What are self-help groups in the Indian context and why are they important in the, specifically uh, with regards to uh, women's rights in India? Mm. So, uh, Preeti, the self-help groups are part of the global microcredit phenomenon and to an extent there are some structural similarities. So it's about a group of, say, 12 to 20 women, all of whom live in the same neighborhood or live in neighboring streets, getting together at least once a week or once in 10 days, saving a certain amount of money that they decide on, uh, opening a small account in the name of the group in the nearest bank branch, and then rotating that money as loans to each other, depending on who needs it this month versus who needs the amount of money the next month. So there are some principles here that are Universal. This is the universal peer lending microcredit model. But what makes the Indian model unique is the link to the public sector banks of India. So what happens with an SHG is that when a group of 20 women get together and form a group, almost one of the first things they do is to make contact with the closest bank branch, uh, public sector bank branch, and open an account in the name of the group. Right now, this the bank then becomes an account holder for the group. And the reason this is important is that it 
uh, makes the women eligible to borrow larger and then larger amounts of money from the bank. In fact, the Indian government and the Central Bank of India offer schemes by which banks are motivated, banks are incentivized to lend to women's self-help groups, especially when the self-help groups consist entirely of women. Uh, and to return to the question of why this is important, India has always had this fairly troubled relationship with converting its system of class banking into mass banking, which is to say that banks used to be seen as institutions for urban areas. It was only the middle classes and the upper middle classes who were account holders. Nobody else could really approach banks. This used to be the scenario until 1969 when banks were nationalized, right? Uh, all private banks, all existing banks were converted into public sector banks by the central government at that point of time. And the idea of that move was to sort of make it mass banking, right? To take banks into rural India, to take banks into small town India, etc. But that vision was never completely realized because it was found soon after that it's the poorest of the poor, landless peasants, uh, very low income households, women in particular of low income households, right? Women of landless peasant households who tended to get excluded from banks. Uh, so the idea of the self-help group, which is that 20 women form their own little group and then they actually knock forcefully on the doors of the bank. So it's almost like the women are organizing themselves into a union. And it's almost like they're saying to the banks, look, you could ignore us earlier because we were not organized, but now we are a, a collective and you can't ignore us anymore. So that particular vision of making banks accessible to the masses of India's poor and to women who are a substantial section of India's poor is an important and exciting potential of the women's self-help groups. There's always been, once again, there's been a critique that feminist groups have had about India's planners, which is for the first three decades after Indian independence, um, women were primarily addressed by India's planning system as housewives, as mothers. Uh, so the programs that the state used to offer them would be health programs or entirely welfare-oriented programs, you know, nutrition, cooking, training, embroidery classes, and so on. When women were actually workers, women were traders, women were petty commodity producers, and women were peasants, women were farmers, right? But ignoring that reality, uh, there was a tendency to see women primarily as mothers, wives, and housewives. Um, the SAG movement, this began to change from the 1980s onwards. For the first time, India's central plan document, the sixth five-year plan, had a chapter called Women and Economic Development, which was a landmark of sorts. So it was acknowledging women's identities as workers, acknowledging that women could actually make a contribution to the GDP and the GNP, the gross domestic product and the gross national product of the country, right? That acknowledgement, in a sense, continues to remain within the SAG program. So it's about offering women access to micro loans. It's about linking women to banks. It's also about, through these SAGs, linking women to anti-poverty programs of the Indian government, of the central government of India. So essentially, it's about moving women to the center of economic development-related planning. So if earlier there was a complete exclusion of women or marginalization of women, that's no longer the case. Now it's all about mainstreaming women within planning. And this is part of a global discourse, as I'm you know, sure many are familiar yes, with. Yes, mainstreaming gender. Exactly, exactly. So the question that we now need to ask, of course, is as feminist researchers and scholars, what are the terms of this inclusion? What does it mean for women to be foregrounded in this manner? So that is a word still remains to be seen. That yes. remains to be. That's something I've tried to answer. Great. So, uh, so then tell us about your own research. Mm that led you in this path of exploring the intersections of women's rights and microfinance in your new book, Women, Microfinance and the State in Neoliberal India. Uh, it's a highly contentious territory, especially in the backdrop of an ever-growing uh, phenomenon of neoliberalism. So I have had a fairly long history working with uh, and looking critically at self-help groups. I began to work with women's microcredit programs from the year 1997. I was part of what we call the All India People Science Movements. And uh, in the late 90s, the science movements were working actively around mobilizing rural women. And one of the tools they used to mobilize women for gender rights was microcredit. So it was not about microcredit as an end in itself. It was not about giving women access to credit so that women may have more loans. 
but it was about using microcredit to mobilize women and to collectivize women to basically organize what we in south asia know as women sanghas or women sangams right so women's unions and that was what really got me excited about the program of this particular organization that i was working with uh, the potential for women to organize as women and then to take on a large number of issues important to women one of those issues for instance was domestic violence i saw some of that happening even in 97 when i was working in southern tamil nadu in some of the southern districts of tamil nadu where i saw that these asset self help groups were not just credit collectives but also local platforms for women to take up issues like domestic violence but it didn't uh, perhaps happen as often as i would have liked to see it happen right uh there were other questions that got me thinking about microcredit more critically uh one of which of course was that it was quite possible uh that these self help groups could also alienate and target especially very poor women because not all women are able to keep up with the constant unrelenting pressure of financial performance you have to make savings every week or, or you have to take out large size loans and then you have to repay the loans that you take out the principal amount every month and the interest and so much there is so much of flux in the lives of the poor so i found that uh, quite often the, uh, women would drop out of these groups because they they were simply unable to keep up with the pace of repayment right and then it almost became a question of making that woman who could not keep pace with the deadlines feel responsible for her own poverty right so it seemed as if she was being made the system was not responsible anymore now that there are micro credit groups um you lose face if you can't keep up with the pace of repayment uh because it's all your peer group members are all your neighbors some of them are your relatives uh so this means that pre existing ties of solidarity and friendship amongst women could also be eroded mm-hmm. uh, because of the pressures of repaying loans besides making a woman feel individually responsible for her own inability to repay her loans so these were questions that got me i was i also began to notice that the relationship between women and the banks were not as smooth as i as they as they were supposed to be on paper banks are supposed to they are mandated by the central government and by the central bank of the country to lend to these sgs but often what they would do uh, would be that they would when a group approached them saying look we are an efficient collective and we uh, taken out and repaid our own loans now you have to give us a loan the bank would turn around and say well that's interesting but i find when i look at my records that your husband took out a loan 15 years ago under a different scheme and didn't repay that and your father in law took out another loan and you you there your son took out a loan and he hasn't repaid his loan so given that each of you is so and so's wife or so and so's mother or so and so's mother in law or so and so's daughter in law you have to repay take responsibility for the full repayment of the loans that your male kin have taken out 5 years ago or 10 years ago and then i'll give your group a loan now this was something that was completely against the rules of uh, the the schemes uh, that were supposed to be creating a bond between banks and the sgs but this is how banking with sgs actually took place in practice so that was something else that sort of set the alarm bells ringing that there is more to the story than meets the eye and there was one more issue also that led me um, towards research which was about this whole there is a dominant narrative uh, priti that women are sort of you know getting together they're saving money they're storming the bastions of banks and then they're using these loans to become micro entrepreneurs and capitalism loves right. that story right, right. and each woman happening. becomes an entrepreneur mm-hmm. and then she bootstraps herself and her family out of poverty but i found that this was hardly the case uh, in fact women were working at the lowest rungs of the informal uh, labor sector or the unorganized labor sector if you like uh women were not entrepreneurs women were actually working at uh, working for pittance uh but they were self employed and they were really populating the lowest rungs of the informal labor sector without minimum wage protection without any other kind of state legislative pr- uh, protection of their rights as workers and some of this exploitation could get more intense when when loans are also part of the picture i found for instance in in parts of southern tamil nadu that women would take out loans uh, to do coconut thatching so they would be thatching coconut leaves and they would sit up pretty much right into midnight this was in addition to other kinds of housework and cooking to be able to finish that loan so that they could repay the loan so it's not really entrepreneurship the word that has that glamorous ring to it that you see you actually see a certain harrowing kind of self exploitation 
and women working in the lowest rungs of the informal sector. Uh, so I guess these are the questions that sort of led me towards research because it was not the, the dominant narrative I felt needed to be challenged with a more grounded stories of what uh, the microcredit scenario actually looked like. Absolutely. Bottom so, up. Yeah, it's so, more complex and complicated yeah. as your research and the many stories that you surface show. And also to um, something that I didn't get to add mm. to uh, what I wanted to ask you was in the West, they, you know, the Grameen Bank and other institutions, uh, you know, Mohammed Yunus is the face of mm. microcredit mm. and its successes, mm-hmm. whereas, and Brak in Bangladesh, mm. right? They're mm. famous for exemplifying microcredit as a way for women's empowerment, mm. in quotes, and also the stereotypes that you alluded to, mm. that women are better repayers, mm. uh, but they actually mm. do it at a great cost to their, mm. Uh, mm. their lives. In, even though there's a lot of research that's come out, even, mm. you know, they've done that, they've done that, it's not worked. Mm. It's, it, it is seen as a silver bullet, you know, mm-hmm. and it's, research like yours also... Mm-hmm brings to the light the complex and complicated aspects exactly, of it. Exactly. Um, so can you share with us some striking examples of women's uh, self-help group strategic use of, as well as failure of microfinance uh, that surprised you during the course of your research? Uh, certainly. Um, in fact, uh, to return to something that you had talked about, which is this, this story, this very neat and happy story that women, all that women require is a uh, Uh, is a loan. And then with these loans, women are able to transform themselves into entrepreneurs. Um, That's very much part of the way in which the Indian state wants to put SNGs to strategic use, which is to say that to use uh, self-help groups to distribute a large amount of loans uh, to groups of women with the expectation that women are going to invest those loans in income generating activity, basically in revenue earning activities, and that women are then going to be able to repay the loans and generate sufficient income to be able to to sort of lift their families above the poverty line, right? So that's the that's part of the dominant story about microfinance. In fact, there is an enterprise loan scheme in India, which offers a certain component of a very attractive component of subsidy. So the entire loan doesn't need to be repaid. The loan is made to the groups as collectives, and a group of twenty women are supposed to be managing an enterprise activity, repaying the loan and lifting themselves above the poverty line. And you can see where the Indian state is coming in because it's, it's a question of making women feel responsible for resolving questions of their own poverty. So sort of take responsibility for your family, take responsibility for yourself. Self-employment is the way to do it. The state is not going to create employment opportunities for you. Uh, you all have to become entrepreneurs. Uh, you have to tap into your own entrepreneurial potential. And what uh, and there's no better way to do it than to use the spaces created by the self-help groups. So you can say that's clearly part of the strategic use that the Indian government wants to make of SNGs, uh, using women as a kind of a safety net during periods of neoliberal economic stress. I mean, there's a lot of writing and discussing about the kind of stresses that neoliberal economic policies bring to very poor families. Now, the question here, the expectation on the part of the government is women work harder, women work longer, women take their take out their own loans from their small microcredit collectives, and somehow women manage this stress. So in a sense, women become the shock absorbers, and women absorb the costs of economic policies that are not really pro-poor, right? So th- this is the, the sort of the use that the government would like to make of SAGs. Uh, But let me tell you a story then about how these enterprise loan schemes actually work out on the field. And it's interesting because one doesn't quite know whether to see this as success or to see it as failure. And if success, from whose point of view, right? So I found when I was tracking the trajectory of these enterprise loans, women are supposed to, uh, like I told you, use them to start micro enterprises. I found that women were doing nothing of the sort, right? Women were fairly determined. They were saying these loans are high risk loans. We are not going to risk our the little capital that we have in this big bank loan that has come to us in these completely unviable income generating activities. In fact, what we're going to do instead is to divide up the money amongst all 20 of us, use it for a variety of our household requirements. And each one, each woman would have a different requirement at that point of time, almost all of which are consumption related. So somebody has a marriage in their family. Somebody else has a college fee, uh, you know, education loan to take care of a third person needs to use it to buy, uh, you know, a piece, a small plot of land, maybe, right? So every family has a pressing need for untied loans, for untied credit, right? And investing that money in an income generating activity is really nobody's priority. 
So I found that women were working around the scheme pretty ingeniously. What they were doing was um, to use to use the money, distribute it amongst each other, and then strike a deal with a local entrepreneur. So let me give you the story of a brick kiln, right, where bricks are made. Uh, the government had, uh, the banks had given an enterprise loan of about a, a lakh, 100,000, uh, to a group of 20 women to set up this brick kiln. What the women did was to contact a local dealer, give him 4,000 rupees, which was a fee that uh, was paid to him, so that he would give them his documents and make it seem as if they were managing what was actually his brick kiln. Pre-existing right? one. Exactly, a pre-existing one and something the women had no interest in managing. And it was being managed by this guy. It was his livelihood. And interestingly, the bank showed up three times to take photographs of the women standing around the brick kiln, holding each other's hands and smiling at the camera, holding up their loan documents, etc. And the bank was extremely happy and went away. Now, the interesting part of the story is that almost everybody, obviously the village uh, and the women themselves, but everybody else in the village, including the bank, knew what the real story was. They knew the women had no interest in managing the brick kiln. They knew the brick kiln was owned and managed by somebody else, a man living in the village. And yet, it was important to create the semblance of enterprise management by the women so that the scheme could work. This music is from a short film by an Indian mining company, Vedanta, on its corporate social responsibility work, or CSR, as they are popularly called in India. This film, available on YouTube, promotes microcredit as a solution to foster entrepreneurship and economic independence among poor Indian women and is typical of various such promotional outreach that seek to project microcredit as a silver bullet to both promote women's rights and end poverty. We now go back to my discussion with feminist scholar Kalpana Karunakaran on her book, Women, Microfinance and the State in Neoliberal India. You are listening to KPFA on 94.1 FM. So from the point of view of the government, the scheme is a success because these loans have been given. given. And this is just one story. And there are multiple examples of shoe-making companies, leather-making units, poultry units, you know, variety of local livelihoods. And it seems everywhere, like it's these groups of women who have initiated these activities and they're managing it successfully. When actually every group has some kind of a local nexus with a local businessman, a local very, very small-scale businessman made some kind of payment to him and taken over that business only for the photograph session, Right. And, but the women were repaying the loans to the bank on time, just as they would repay any other loan, which is through their wage earnings. And this money was being put to, and for a woman, the amount of money was about 5,000 per woman or rupees 10,000 per woman or rupees 15,000 at the most. And remember, there was a, a, a subsidy component. So the entire loan didn't have to get repaid. So from the point of view of the women as well, it was a success story, right? And from the point of view of the government, it was a very successful story, right? But... Uh, so I'm saying, but you could say that in some ways, this story points to the fundamental failure of microfinance, because what it does is to explore one of the myths of microfinance, which is that all that you need to do is to give the poor loans and look at the way they're going to climb out of poverty. Right. And what were the rates uh, of interest you're talking about? So on this particular scheme, it was about, uh, at that point of time, at the time that I did my research, it was between, it ranged between 12 and 15 percentage annual rates of interest. Right, 12 and 15 percent of the annual rates of interest are much higher than the regular bank rates of interest on, say, loans to urban groups like Mm -hmm. loans for education, loans for consumption, and so on. But 12 to 15 rates percentage rates of annual interest are much lower than uh, the rates at which the poor could get loans from local money lenders from the informal financial sector, where the interest rates would be much higher. So, to that extent, there was a sort of an economic benefit for the families that use these loans. And were, so, there, were there, and this is something that came to me as you were talking about yeah, sure, different examples, sure. 
were there cases where they actually could use the credit to start something and uh, be able to repay and you know uh, have agency in doing something on sure and i saw i saw examples of that as well but these were almost never collectively managed or group managed enterprises so these would be for instance mm-hmm. an, a small business owned by managed by a woman and a husband or a woman and her mother or a woman and her brother right so one other household member usually or sometimes a small a single woman herself would be operating a small uh, small scale business but these were really tiny tiny businesses right it would be for instance the front portion of somebody's house would double up into a local shop it would be a small shop which would have fruits the local newspapers or the front portion of somebody's house would become a hotel it would be a home based hotel it would just be the front room of their house and the family would cook and serve and so on but that was a business in that context invariably these businesses did not have the uh, capacity to generate employment for others all that we mean by a business here is a household member with the support of his or her other household members running a small scale livelihood activity that's what we actually just to get a sense of how far away we are from some of the conventional notions we might have about enterprises you know capital intensive large scale generating employment for others so then in conclusion what are your thoughts um, yeah. on microfinance as a quote empowerment strategy what should a responsible state really be doing i'm hopeful about uh, self help groups uh, pretty largely because the groups that i have uh, met and interacted with have rarely if ever stopped with the goal of financial inclusion right uh, the women have mobilized often for uh, around local issues of importance to them they've used these self help groups as platforms to put pressure on local authorities of the state on the local revenue department official or the local village development official to ask for to demand better facilities for the village sometimes it might be sometimes that uh, they need street lights it might be that they need the bus to stop right in front of their village when it didn't used to do that earlier it might be that the problem is one of water and that usually tends to be a problem uh, the local water supplies have dried up they depend on the local authorities for water but that's not happening so putting pressure on the local state at very very local levels to deliver basic amenities better and uh, there are often stories also women agitating before ration shops this is part of india's public distribution system the poor rely on this on these network of ration shops that provide rice kerosene sugar wheat at subsidized rates uh, and often there's a great deal of non transparency and corruption in the operation of the ration shops the sgs can also be means to be very effective watchdogs at local levels this is something that i found more uh, rarer than that though are the cases of action that sgs have taken against say men who beat their wives right there would be stories of uh, uh, you know a, an, an entire group of 15 women gathering in somebody's home actually physically preventing an act of violence an act of assault by a man separating the man from his wife uh, if necessary taking her away giving her safe shelter in somebody's home it's mediating to resolve the dispute and so on and, and this is a very important area of action this doesn't happen as often as as i was saying earlier as i would like to see it happen because there is a very very strong ideological uh, you know position that uh, uh, you know after all it's the man it's the husband then some degree of violence is an acceptable part of a woman's life and how how can we interfere in somebody's personal affairs right it, i mean it's after all you required the feminist movement to say the personal is political and that's not an understanding that is easily available outside of say feminist circles right you have to fight for that understanding you have to take that understanding out through a variety of means like say cultural means and so on it doesn't automatically happen just because women are getting together in small groups and saving money and giving each other loans um in fact there were groups that would tell me we don't encourage women to talk about their personal issues for the reason uh, that you know somebody's mother in law could be in the same group or your husband's so you know how marriage is in india ah you move out of your village you move into your husband's village you become an sg member in your husband's village the group could be packed with your sisters in law and your mother in law right so it's not a safe space for you it's not necessarily a safe space yeah. right so these are issues that uh, you know we we uh, but something else that was very interesting for me was that women were often creatively using their links to the state uh, what the sgs had done was to uh make it possible for the women to approach the state directly to you could go into a bank you had sometimes ties of close friendship with the bank manager who's an important man locally 
uh, you through the state anti poverty programs you had links to the rural development administration sometimes the sgs would have links with the collector of the district right so the head of the government at the district level so all of which meant that women could use those links creatively to be able to counter local patriarchies some cases abusive husbands in other cases abusive sons in law so you could a woman would tell her uh, her son in law that if you continue to harass or abuse my daughter i'll go to the police station using the sg i'll i use the letter head of the sg i'll give a letter to the policeman not as myself but as a woman who is backed by 20 other women in the village because the 20 of us are now organized into an sg right and um, and actually uh, i have heard several women report that the police have to file a, what is what we call an fir the first information report if the complaint is offered by an sg uh very often police are found dismissive of cases right they don't take cases especially where they concern women and issues of violence but there is apparently uh, at least a, in the perception of the women a pressure on the police to take cases seriously when women approach them through their self help groups through their collective organizations so this is what i meant when i said that women can use their ties to the state creatively and they can use those ties to challenge local patriarchies uh and the control of men over their lives within the context of their villages uh and their neighborhoods and i think those are uh those that's what is in some ways i would like to think of as the potential of sgs to empower women that they continue to function as local unions for women as local sanghas for women uh and of course like i said earlier those unions could be fractured by tensions relating to who's not repaying a loan mm-hmm. but that's part of the game Absolutely. So I noticed that you focused on the SGs and not microfinance. So microfinance yes. is but one small tool, yes, yes. and not cannot yes. take center stage in as right. anything as a feminist strategy or anything, right? It's, right? it's one tool and has to be done in very accountable ways. So what should a responsible state be doing then to ensure that microfinance is a tool that works effectively for right. for women's right. for women's economic rights and independence? Right. One of the first things I think it should be doing, it should have done already, is to ensure that. women have the required training the capacities to manage their micro banks uh you might argue that a self help group becomes a micro bank uh, and sometimes a group can have hundreds of thousands of rupees in its local bank account um often there are stories far too often there are stories of groups breaking up because there's so much suspicion between the group members and group leaders group leaders are also women from the group uh, women with a little more education let's say they've uh, you know completed class 10 or they've completed class 12 or somebody has sometimes in occasional cases a college degree who becomes then the leader of the group because literacy skills are prized right but they're not uniformly available to all members of the group so there tends to be the concentration of power within groups sometimes between younger women and older women because the younger women also tend to be more literate uh, uh more more comfortable with formal literacy and uh, numeracy so what this means uh, is that uh, there's a great deal of heartburn uh, there's a great deal of uh, you know um, allegations and counter allegations about how so and so the leaders took our money and the leaders then defend themselves very emotionally and say no we took nobody's money so in fact there have been many many cases of groups mismanaging their own money of losing money so perhaps one of the first things the government could do is to um, and and certainly this is something the government says it will do but hasn't gotten around to doing it efficiently enough is to organize very very sort of um, uh, solid rigorous auditing facilities for these groups is to provide training to as many group members as possible to build the capacities of the women of the collectives so that power is not always concentrated by two women within the groups So there's a lot of money the government needs to invest in order to get that going. But then it's a question of asking the government to, you know, put your uh, money where your mouth is, right? So that's certainly one thing uh, I could think of. Another thing would be also to talk about things the government shouldn't be doing. And one of those things is to use the SGs as captive audience for a variety of local government programs at the you know, district level, sub-district level. So to sort of send out this invite to sgs but everybody knows it's not an invite you just have to show up otherwise you don't get your loans so it's you see everywhere almost now government programs the audience is that of women sweltering and sweating in the heat right women what what kind of programs are so about? these would be rural development programs it would be that the collector of the district the head of the district administration is with is visiting one of the blocks and they're inaugurating a new scheme 
And who would the audience be? Well, 80% of the audience would be women mobilized through the self-help groups. So the, the idea of mobilizing women is to create this, this sense that, you know, there's tremendous support for government programs at the grassroots, right? But actually how this has come about is by telling the women, if you don't show up with 50 women here, 100 women there, you don't get your loans. Because all the loans have to be sanctioned also through the rural development department, right? And women really hate that. They have a sense that their time is being taken for granted. Uh, they were, the costs of their being present here, spending a whole day sometimes uh, away from their families, away from their work in their, in their farms and fields and households is pretty high to them, right? The costs of doing this. So using women as, you know, this, this commandeering women's, uh, 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 you know, presence and assuming that women's time is always a freely given resource, women's time and women's labor, well, that's something that governments should not be doing. You know, there's no two opinions of that, I think. Um, and so this is the thing with the state. The question you asked me is an important question, Preeti, because it's it's all, it's always the way women's groups have approached the state, I think. On the one hand, you want resources vital for survival from the state. So you want loans. You want the loans with subsidy, right? You want them to reach you with the minimum corruption possible, right? So you need the state. You can't ask the state to go to hell. And you want the state to be an ally when you are challenging local patriarchies, right? You want the state to help you in the, in the form of the police, in the form of the revenue officer. But on the other hand, the state can also be a direct oppressor of women. Mm -hmm. So you need to constantly fight the state, even as you want the state to be on your side. Right. And um, speaking of interventions, uh, one of the things you also highlight in your book that I um, was happy to read about is mm -hmm. interventions made by groups like mm -hmm. the All India Democratic Women's mm -hmm. Association, Aidwa, in mm -hmm. uh, being a, mm. uh, holding these instruments mm. accountable, right? Mm. So can you speak to that a little bit? Certainly. In fact, the the org women's organizations, human rights organizations have stepped into the picture also because now there is there are not only self-help groups in the Indian microfinance scenario, there are also these privately financed microfinance institutions. They're called MFIs. Many of them model themselves on the Grameen Bank. Sometimes they have other models as well. Um, and these groups are structured somewhat differently. The difference is that women don't say with each other, uh, they don't have an account with a nationalized bank. They actually borrow from the MFI. So the MFI or the microfinance institution becomes the financial service provider. The MFI is the lender, women are borrowers. Um, so this means that there can be a lot of abuses of power, as you can imagine. Uh, very often there are reports, there are allegations that... Uh, the women don't quite know what is the interest they're paying because they're hidden costs. The, the policy of pricing of the loans is a non-transparent policy, right? So they say one interest, but then they pay, they end up paying a lot more money. And these interests tend to be on the higher side, uh, higher usually than the interest charged within self-help groups, right? And the women are conscious that in the case of the self-help groups, the interest they generate goes back to the group. It goes back to the collective. Here, the interest the women pay goes back to the microfinance institution, the service provider. Uh, but that's just one issue. There have been other issues also that these MFIs have been, have often felt the pressure of dispersing large amounts of money. So what they've done is to over lend to groups of women. Um, and sometimes they lend to SAGs as well. So this over lending, this pre of over lending can mean that poor families are suddenly borrowing larger and larger amounts of money, which they don't have the ability to repay because they can't productively even absorb that credit as a household unit. So how do they repay such large amounts of money? By borrowing from somewhere else. So then this becomes a recipe for disaster, for financial disaster. And households can go spiraling into debt crisis. Uh, there have been reports of suicides of women, sometimes of families. Uh, the, the reason may not only be the MFI, there may be other lenders, but the MFI may be part of the pressure. There are also cases of coercive repayment strategies, such as barging into people's homes, taking away their assets, taking away a sewing machine from somebody's home, you know, locking up uh, somebody's home, taking the key away, uh, right? Calling out, publicly shaming uh, somebody by showing up at their doorstep and abusing them in the in, in the center of their of the village public. So these strategies of coercion, these sort of very punitive repayment strategies, have also uh, created a lot of rural discontent. Uh, especially when they're coupled with overlending. These are some of the issues that groups like the All India Democratic Women's Association have taken up and other civil society organizations. These organizations, in fact, have taken a very nuanced position with respect to microfinance. So they are asking the state to increase its support to self-help groups. They say finance SAGs, don't reduce, and they're asking the state to directly finance SAGs through public sector banks. 
which goes back to the first point that I talked about, right? That the poor did not have access to banks earlier, but now through the SAGs, it seems like some access is opening up for them. So groups like women's organizations are saying, build on that, strengthen that, but regulate, strongly, strictly regulate the private sector, microfinance institutions, and uh, don't uh, sort of give them a level playing field with self-help groups, because what happens is sometimes they tend to compete with much smaller self-help groups out of the picture. So that's where you require voices like women's groups um, to sort of join the fight, uh, you know? Yeah. Do you see that happening? Do you see that research like yours, that even like Grameen Bank has research that shows that it's microcredit is in and of itself is very problematic as a yeah. tool for women's rights. Is this research being then informed to re-strategize and, you know, is the right thing happening? Or do you see that, hap- you know, are we heading in that direction? Well, it's kind of too early to to get a sense of the direction that we are heading in, Preeti. But one thing I can certainly say is because of the pressure that has come um, from women's groups and from civil society groups, because of the outrage around the suicides, uh, and also because state governments sometimes, like the Andhra state government of the, you know, the state of Andhra Pradesh, have uh, stepped in to sort of curtail the lending activities of microfinance institutions, the central bank of the country has come under pressure to draft a bill to regulate the activities of microfinance institutions. So it certainly is the case that some of these voices are being picked up and amplified. And uh, there will be some pressures of accountability that will be directed towards microfinance institutions. I certainly see that happening. But in terms of strengthening SAGs adequately, in terms of pushing banks to lend to SAGs, I would certainly like to see more of that happening. This sure. came to me as somebody who was also who began my journalistic career learning and covering SAGs. How is the media, both mainstream and now, of course, we live in a time of saturated social <laughs> media uh, and other forms of other alternative media too. Um, how has the media been covering it over the years? Is it like false positive spin? Mm-hmm. Or has have they been able to get to the complexity of these issues that you've been addressing? Uh, I would say the media has been overall disappointing. Um, So earlier when I was tracking the media closely, I found that most of the stories, I mean, the SAG would be the feel-good story, right? It would be the rural women's empowerment story. So it was like that script was already written. The frame was in place. All they needed was to locate it in this district or that village and then talk to women who would almost say more or less the same things because that's the, the way they would. So child labor would be the rural distress story. You know what I mean? So it's like these frames are already operational and SAGs were always Uh, you know, uh, belong very neatly within the frame of women empowering themselves, uh, you know, feel good stories about women starting small shops and escaping the clutches of money lenders. Um, So obviously, you don't get a lot of complexity, you don't get to see a lot of complexity in those stories. I've had to turn to research for accounts for more complex accounts uh, that say, look, the reality is more messy. It's not a linear story of empowerment and poverty alleviation. There are so many roadblocks along the way. The challenges are multiple. Um, but of course, now we have we have uh, far, a larger number of media interventions now, and uh, we have stories that are mapping rural dis- distress in very interesting ways, uh, rural migration patterns. Uh, but I would still like to see a greater focus on what it is women are exactly doing with their self help groups. I really haven't come across too many exciting stories about self self help groups. You know, when I, as a researcher, had an aha moment. Right when I felt that oh this is a great story about SAGs it goes to the heart of the matter it shows us a picture we don't usually get to see I've had to turn to my own research to do that. <laughs> yeah. You've been listening to an enriching discussion on women's organizing in India through the particular phenomenon of self-help groups popular in South Asia and how microfinance or microcredit has come to have a complex and notorious stranglehold over women's self-organizing in the guise of promoting women's empowerment and women's rights. Up next, Apex Express freelancer Melissa Hung files for us this story spotlighting a critical documentary on human rights violations in China. Hooligan Sparrow is one of 15 films on the 2017 Oscar shortlist for Best Documentary. Filmmaker Nanfu Wang follows Chinese human rights activist Ye Haiyan, known as Hooligan Sparrow, as she seeks justice for six girls who were raped. She organizes a protest but is arrested the next day. Upon release, Ye is harassed and tracked by the government. Wang herself becomes a target of intimidation tactics. She smuggled footage out of China in order to make this film. Tell me about your film for someone who hasn't seen it. 
Cooling Sparrow is a film about some of the most courageous women in China who staged a protest against the governments to expose the injustice and human rights violation and the consequences they faced for protesting. Your film follows these women who are protesting a rape case of six schoolgirls. Can you tell me about the case and did you know about it when you set out to make this documentary? Um, when I started the documentary, I didn't know the rape case was going to happen. I returned to China on May 13th and the rape case happened a few days before I arrived. And what happened is in Hainan province, um, there were six young girls aged between 11 and 14 were raped by their school principal and a government official. And it was the national breaking news, a lot of sensation and a lot of controversy uh, on what really happened. And in China, according to the law at the time, that if the sexual offenders can prove that they paid the victims or they had gave them gifts, um, then this could be child prostitution instead of rape or sexual abuse. And a lot of powerful sexual offenders had actually got away with serious sentence uh, by claiming that they have paid the victims. So when this case happened, a lot of human rights activists and lawyers were trying to use the case to expose the systematic crime that had been happening over the decades that people get away with rape by claiming that. How, so this sounds like it's not an isolated incident. It's, it's something that's quite, that was quite prevalent. How often did this happen? Uh, when I knew about this, I started researching and I saw there were 13 cases that month all over the country about young girls being raped. After I followed the protest, the activists and lawyers who went to Hainan province to protest, I talked to the lawyer um, and asked her why they were doing this. And she told me that because in China, a lot of school principals or some government officials, they were using the young girls as uh, bribes uh, to get political favor. I see. And this law that allowed them to get away with light sentences, which is uh, classifying it as child prostitution instead of, of rape, which would have a harsher sentence. Is this law something that is still in existence now? It was repealed a year after I shot the film, after the lawyers had been fighting for it for decades. Do you think the protest had any effect on the outcome of these this case? I think it sure does. Um, the protest went viral the next day. Hooligan Sparrow, she um, held up a sign and on the sign it said, hey, principal, why don't you get a room with me and leave the kids alone? Because of the sense of humor in the sign and because of the outreach that most people felt, the sign was reposted um, thousands of times and thousands of thousands of people, they uh, held up the same sign and took a picture of themselves and posted the picture on the internet. So it went viral and the case had much more impact and that's when the government started responding. So the documentary, Hooligan Sparrow, actually the case is the trigger and what happened is how the government reacted to it. And they arrested Hooligan Sparrow and traced the activists uh, from one city to another. It sounds like social media plays a, a big role in, in civil rights and uh, women's rights in China. I think social media really changed how activism works um, because in China, the censorship is very effective with traditional media. The government controls all the media. Um, they decided what is published and what is being aired on TV. But with social media, there is censorship that the government could decide uh, which gets posted or not. But, uh, well, by doing that, one way they do is to program, pre-program certain words 
that you cannot post it on the internet. For example, Tiananmen Square protest, uh, a lot of people did not know that, and they couldn't post it. But there were also breaking news like Hainan rape case, which is not a sensitive term until they became one. So between that window, before the government censored it, it was the time that people can circulate the information and people would have access to the information that they otherwise would not see on the TV or newspaper. So I think social media really changed how the information is circulated. You mentioned that Hooligan Sparrow has a, a very unique sense of humor, which helped her message get out. She seems to be very comfortable or, or good at getting attention. And she also seems, I was struck by how calm she was in your documentary. You know, she's been arrested. People are beating her. There's crowds of people outside her house. She gets evicted. But the I believe the same night she gets evicted after she packs up her things, she, she has a goodbye party and goes to karaoke. Is she... Uh, was she really like that in person? What What is her personality like? Yeah, um, she has a great sense of humor. And she also, uh, as people who know her or know her activism, which is very unique and radical. And I think that's why her activism was so effective. Um, because the traditional activism rarely attracted any attention, especially in China when the activism would not be reported or when they were portrayed, the activists usually were portrayed as um, people who have mental health issues. So at the protest, most other people were holding up signs or shouting out the slogans, but her sign was... Hey, principal, why don't you get along with me and leave the kids alone? So because of the sense of humor, that's when ordinary people reacted to it. You're listening to Apex Express on KPFA 94.1 FM. Our guest is filmmaker Nan Fu Wong, whose documentary feature film Hooligan Sparrow has been shortlisted for an Oscar. So you set out without knowing if you actually had a film and it became something totally different from what you set out to make. Yeah, I think I went back to China. I had an idea in mind, but what happened was totally different from what I had expected, which I think is a better film because if I had made a film that ends exactly the same way as I had started with, I think it would be a boring story. Right, it's not boring at all. You're... You're also at risk in the film, and we have it's it's like a thriller because we see you being chased and uh, people harassing you. How did you uh, keep your composure and keep filming while you were being threatened? I think there are a few things. One is seeing the activist, including Ye Haiyan, how she coped with it. They lived in China their entire life, and their life is constantly under threat and fear and harassment, but they are still doing what they do. And that's really inspiring to me, especially I felt that I could leave if I wanted, at least I had a better chance of leaving the country than they do. Um, so what is the reason that I can't do it? And the other thing is, I was really shocked that I lived in China my whole life, but. I did not know those things were happening in China. And I realized that my family, my friends, and probably the majority of people in China did not know. And I am a storyteller, and I had the ability to document it, to tell the story. And I was there. And if I didn't do it, nobody would know what happened. And that scares me. And I think that fear is greater than the fear of personal safety. Have you been back to China? Since the film was released? No. Are you are you afraid of going back? Because you are um, a target and it seems like they were also um, calling up your family and looking for you. I don't know. Um, it's hard for me to assess the risk and the consequences of going back. And I could expect that there would be some kind of a retaliation. 
and I've been trying to decide when I'm ready to to go back. And until I really try, I could not predict what could happen. So it's really um, evaluating when I'm ready and whether I'm ready. How about your family? Are they ready? Have they been... Um, I don't. I, I wonder if they've been surveillanced, surveilled since you've been involved in this project. Yeah, my family was visited by the national security agents not that long ago, and they told my family that they are monitoring what I say in interviews, and asked my family to tell me that to not say anything negative about China. Um, I debated after my family told me about that because I didn't want them to suffer anything. Um, but also, then I thought if I became silent now, if I don't say anything, then the government would know that their tactics are effective and then they would just use it more and more, which I do not want that to happen. Now, you uh, grew up in a rural village in China, is that right? And how did you become a storyteller? Um, my dad, I think he influenced me a lot. Since I was a little, he encouraged me to read a lot, to tell stories, and I always loved the literature, loved the stories. And when I was in China, my major was literature, and I wanted to become a writer, but then I realized you don't graduate from school and become a writer the next day. So I was thinking I want to write um, and I hope that could be my job. So I wanted to become a journalist, um, but I didn't want to study journalism in China. So I applied to the universities in the U.S. to study journalism. And in 2011, I came and I started for a year uh, and finish a master program in media studies. And during that program, I learned a little bit of a different medium, including radio, TV, film, advertisement, all kinds. And I discovered documentary because growing up in China, I didn't see a documentary. It was not accessible to most of the people. The Documentaries that are shown on TV is usually about the history, the landscape, and the food. There's really real documentaries about current affairs and human interest. And those independent documentaries that do those did not get distribution. So really, when I came to the U.S., I started watching documentaries. And when I saw them, I realized this is something that I wanted to do. It matches every aspects of my interest and passion. So then I applied to another university, New York University, to study documentary. How do you feel about the being on the Oscar shortlist? It was really exciting. Um, and I felt it really helped that for the film to be seen by more people. And that's always my number one goal. I hope that the film would be seen widely, especially by people who... Actually, I would say both by people who know China and don't know China, because I felt, even me, that I thought that I know China so well, that I'm Chinese, that I lived my life there. I knew very little. So I really hope that the film can show people what's going on there. Well, congratulations on this and best of luck for ending up in hopefully the top five. Thank you. You're listening to Apex Express on KPFA 94.1 FM. I'm Melissa Hung. I spoke to filmmaker Nan Fu Wang, whose film Hooligan Sparrow is among the 15 finalists for Best Feature Documentary Oscar. Hooligan Sparrow opens January 6th at the Four Star Theater in San Francisco and will also screen January 9th at the Roxy Theater in San Francisco. That brings us to the end of tonight's show. I've been your host and producer, 
Preeti Mangla Shekhar. Thank you to Melissa Hung, Robin Takiyama for production support, and our board up Mike Biggs for his technical support for tonight's show. Tune back in next week for another edition of Epic Six Press at Thursdays at 7 p.m. Uh, you can also email us show ideas, feedback, and suggestions to apex at kpfa.org. Thank you.